Okay, so good afternoon. Good to quote unquote see everybody. All right, so uh, I'm not going to go through this again. We did this last time, but I was not quite done with talking about Python and some of its virtues. So we went through this, 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 and this. Uh, one of the things I don't remember if I had time to point out clearly, but Python itself is very Spartan. You actually can't do a, well, you can do a lot with Python by itself, but in terms of mathematical things, there's all these add-on packages that you need to use. So I've already introduced math here. So you, you just literally type import math and that brings in the math library. And that gives you access to all these other math functions. The other two that are very, very commonly used are NumPy, which stands for numerical Python. And the other one is SciPy, which stands for scientific Python. So it's almost always the case that you'll be using NumPy as well as SciPy. Now this uh, syntax you'll notice here, so you can just type import math. You could just in, uh, type in import NumPy and same thing with SciPy. But what a lot of people do is in order to not have to type NumPy every time, like if you wanna do a dot product, you'd have to type NumPy dot dot numpy dot cross so what the kind of the convention is and this is almost everyone does this so everyone knows what it means in other words is you say import numpy as np and now you can refer to numpy as np so then it's just np dot dot np dot cross and so forth it just saves you a little bit of typing so the same thing with scipy import scipy as sp Again, everyone uses SP. So rather than typing out scipy linalg.det for determinant, you can just type sp.linalg.det. Uh, and you'll see variations on that. So some people don't wanna have to type out this whole thing. So they'll combine all of this into a alias, which is essentially what this is. I tend to do, to try to, keep the use of aliases to a minimum, uh, but I will use these because they're so common. So you'll, you'll see that in the tutorial. All right, before I do this, uh, with showing how we do linear algebra matrices and vectors in MATLAB and Python, I did want to just show you this. This is, uh, I, you know, as I said in previous classes, I haven't been ex as excited about a new programming language as I have been with Python for quite some time. And it took me a little, t a little bit to kind of figure out why that was. Why am I so excited? I mean, I'm not normally excited about new programming languages because it's some new thing I have to learn. There's different syntax. There's pros and cons to every language. So why would I want to learn a new language? So I'm generally resistant unless I'm convinced that there's something that's going to be beneficial uh, to me as well as the, the community. So I finally figured out what was that attraction. What, what is it that makes Python so compelling as a programming language? So, so this is my attempt to try to put it into kind of a table form here. So this is what I'm calling the scientific computing stack. So in computing, a stack is the layers of things, hardware and software, that you need in order to do something. So if you want to check Facebook, well, you need hardware. So the hardware includes a CPU, it includes some storage, and then on top of that, you have a operating system. So that's your Android, that's your iOS, that's your Mac OS, that's Windows. And then on top of that, you need a browser or you need some application which will allow you to access Facebook. So that's the stack. You need all of those things stacked one on top of the other and then they're in that order. So the operating system is the software interface between the hardware below and all the application stuff being done up here. Now in scientific computing, 
things are a bit more complicated than that, but it's basically that same idea. So let me start at the bottom and I'm not gonna go through this in great detail and not all of this is relevant to us in this class, but just to give us kind of an idea of why I think Python is, is a, a really compelling tool for us. So again, if you start down at the bottom, you have your hardware. So you have your processors, your CPUs and GPUs, you have your storage, which is long-term storage. And then you have your memory, which is uh, usually DRAM, dynamic random access memory. So that's, that's your computer, that's your phone, that's your tablet, whatever. That's the actual hardware. Immediately on top of that is the operating system. Nowadays, there really are only two families of operating systems. It's either Windows or Unix. So everything other than Windows is, is Unix. So uh, Mac OS is Unix based. Linux, of course, is Unix based. Android is Unix based. So essentially, some form of Unix is the operating system on, on, almost, on almost all the computing devices that we would use for doing scientific computing, unless you're doing it on, on a Windows computer. Then on top of the operating system, we would have our programming languages. So that would be things like Fortran, C++, Java, and Python. Then on top of the programming languages would be libraries and packages. So for us, these would be, I, I think I've mentioned Blas and LAPAC. Uh, so Blas is basic linear algebra. I still can't remember what the S stands for. And LAPAC is linear algebra package. So when you ask MATLAB or Python or pretty much any uh, Mathematica, any high level computing system to do matrix multiplication or find an inverse, it's actually calling routines in these packages. There are literally functions that are already built in. Someone else has written them. They're well tested. They're very efficient. They run very quickly. And so they've been put into the form of these libraries and packages. Generally speaking, we don't access them directly. We access them through some other software like MATLAB, for example. And there's a whole bunch of these. So there's linear algebra, statistics, machine learning, parallel computing. So there's a whole host of libraries and packages for various fields, various types of mathematics, various types of computer operations that we would wanna do. So those are written in one of these programming languages. In fact, many of them are written in Fortran. So Blas and LAPAC were originally written in Fortran. And even though that's all hidden from you, it's under the hood, the actual calculations are being done in a different language, typically Fortran or maybe C++. Then on top of the libraries and packages would be your math software. So this is the MATLAB, this is the Mathematica, and it's the Python. So maybe you can start to see where I'm going with this. On top of the math software would be general purpose codes. So those are codes that you, if you work in industry, they'll spend tens of thousands of dollars to buy, whether it's ANSYS or COMSOL or whatever. And these are general purpose codes that can be used for lots of different scientific and engineering applications. And then there are field specific codes. So in my field of computational fluid dynamics, we have a whole host of CFD codes that are specifically designed to solve fluids problems like Fluent, Open Foam, and there's many, many more. So that's the scientific computing stack. When I came along, when I was <clears throat> your, at your stage in our academic careers, basically my entry point was right here. If I wanted to do me anything meaningful on a computer numerically, I had to write my own Fortran code to do it. We did not have math software in the same way we do today. We did have some libraries and packages. Uh, there's one here I've listed IMSL, which isn't really in use anymore, but that was very common. It's developed in the 1970s. It's very, very efficient, written in Fortran but basically it's been replaced by Blas and, 
LA PEC. And so we had some of these libraries and packages, but not many. So basically we were either stuck down here using the programming languages, or we were up here using general purpose and or field specific codes. And most of these in between were not available to us. Now there were libraries and packages, but they weren't necessarily available to the common user. So for me, whatever I wanted to do, generally I was writing a Fortran code. And then along came C++, C and C++, which had some improvements, still slower, not as efficient as Fortran. And then eventually Java is really more for applications that are, are run through browsers on a computer. And then came along Python. So you can look at Python as being a programming language that could replace C++. I mentioned Dropbox. The whole application Dropbox is written in Python. And they just made the decision, we're gonna write it in Python instead of C++ like most applications are for various reasons. But, so th this was where I had my entry point into computing, scientific computing. For most of you and in the quote unquote modern era, for most of us, this is our entry point through math software. So we learn MATLAB, we use MATLAB here and there. You can do nice things with plotting and so forth and manipulations of vectors and matrices in MATLAB, or some people prefer Mathematica, but you can also use Python in exactly the same way. So my point here is that for us in MME 350, whether you use MATLAB or Python, doesn't really matter a whole lot. They're both roughly equivalent in terms of the amount of energy and time required for you to learn to use them and feel comfortable with them. But the point I wanna make is everything that's underlined in red, I know the red isn't very visible, but everything that's underlined is Python related. Python is everywhere. Up and down the stack. So wherever you start, generally at the math software level, you can move down the stack and or you can move up the stack, depending on what happens in the future. So for those of you who go, you get your bachelor's degree, go out into industry, you're more likely to move up the stack. So you might still be doing some programming in Python. You might be using some general purpose codes and you'll probably be using some field specific codes. At all three of those levels, you could be using Python. So why, for example, why is open foam underlined here? It's not that it's written in Python, it's actually not written in Python, but there's what's called a wrapper. So you take a code, which in this case was an existing code written in C and Fortran, and then you put a, literally a wrapper around it. And what that does is it makes it look to the user as if it's a Python function and you're just calling a Python function. But under the hood of that wrapper is full-blown open foam CFD code. Same thing with Phoenix, which is a general purpose open source code that does finite element methods, same idea. So Phoenix is written in Fortran and C++, but with the Python wrapper around it, it looks to you as if it's Python. So you can move up the stack or if you get in more into research, go to grad school, get more into research, then it may be that you'll be moving down the stack. And so instead of using Python purely as a, as a replacement for MATLAB as math software, you may be using it more as a programming language and writing your own code to do CFD or computational style mechanics or some uh, big data, you know, machine learning algorithm you may be writing your own code. So the point is you don't have to switch tools. So what's happened to me, and this is what got me so excited about Python, and I'm not unique in any way in this regard. So many, many of us that do write our own codes have developed this kind of two-step process. 
So when we have an idea and we want to prototype a new idea for a code, we'll typically do it in MATLAB or Mathematica. It's not the fastest way. It's not the most efficient way to actually run it. But you can get something working. You can kind of see if it works. It's higher level. So I don't have to worry about you know, doing matrix, matrix, multiplication, all that kind of stuff. It's all built in. And if it works the way I want, and then I want to write it as rather than a prototype code as a production code, then I typically come down here and I use another programming language. So for a number of years, many of us have been in this mode where we're doing either MATLAB or Mathematica for prototyping, and then Fortran or C for actual production code. Now, you don't have to switch. You just use Python for both. So you can prototype something in Python and the parts that work well and are fast and efficient, you leave them, you don't touch them. For the parts that you think you can do better, you can write a better code. You move down here and you write a better code for just those parts. Not the whole thing, just those parts. So, so this very much a multi-leveled kind of way of seeing and using Python is really what's gotten me so excited about the future of Python. And as I've said before, in terms of libraries and packages, in terms of software, there's a constant increase in the number of tools available to us. There's a whole worldwide network of people that are developing these. It's all open source. Everyone's doing it out of their own goodwill for the community. And so it's this whole ecosystem of tools that's being developed. If you move into statistics, then R, stats models, it's all there. If you move into machine learning, scikit-learn, TensorFlow, and others, they're all there. If you get into parallel computing on massive supercomputers, MPI, 4Pi, PyCuda, they're all there. So you can stay within the, the Python ecosystem no matter where you end up, uh, what you end up doing. Just another simplistic way to look at it is uh, if you think about, you know, as an undergraduate, of course, like MME350, what's the best tool? As a graduate student, a PhD student doing computational work, what's the best tool? As a researcher or someone in industry, what's the best tool? And it used to be for, uh, for many, many years, the best tool at all three or of four of those levels, depending on how you look at it, could be different. So we might say use MATLAB as undergraduates, but once we get into the higher level, you want more efficiency and so forth, then you should switch to Fortran or C++. Uh, and then if you're gonna do stuff in industry or full-blown research, maybe it's Fortran, C++, or even something more specialized as far as a programming language in, in a particular field. Now, the best answer for all of those is the same, it's Python. Now, it, again, it might be Python at different levels, Python at the programming language level, Python at the math software level, or Python at the general purpose or field specific code level, but it's still Python. So you're buying into a ecosystem that uh, is very attractive in that respect. So that's really why I've been getting so excited about Python. Yes, Marshall. What am I missing? It's over my head. Enlighten us, Tim. Sorry, Professor. I was asking about the first assignment due date earlier. Oh. Oh, okay. Yes. All right. Okay. I thought it was some profound thing about uh, programming and Python and what, whatnot. All right, okay, we'll come back to, to that in a little bit. All right, so that's, that's really, that's finally kind of my way of picturing why Python is so attractive uh, in, in this way uh, for our use. So again, you can use whatever you want. I'm not requiring Python. If you came to me and said, you know, I'm open to, Whatever is best for me in the long term, what should I use? I would say Python. But for most of us, MATLAB is what we're more familiar with. 
and maybe you want to stick with that. And there are certainly many, many people in the engineering industry and academia that are still using MATLAB. So uh, I, that may always be the case that there are some using MATLAB, some using Python, and maybe it'll be the case that you want to have some exposure to both for the long term, or it may be that 10 years down the road, 15 years down the road, everyone in the industry pretty much is using Python and MATLAB has been rendered to a museum. Another, and this is, this is coming from an academic, uh, so you know that this is not something that everyone cares about, but as I've said before, MATLAB is, is put out by a company, it's commercial software. And what happens when that company goes away or what happens when that company decides to go in another direction? And then MATLAB no longer exists or no longer exists in the form that uh, we as engineers would prefer. Whereas Python, that will never happen because there will always be people within the ecosystem of Python users that and developers that have our interest at heart as well. So uh, obviously it's free, so that's also an advantage. Okay, let me then turn to, and I'm just gonna spend a few slides on this, but just showing you how to do basic vector matrix operations and how to enter matrices, for example, in MATLAB, uh, Mathematica here is here as well, but we'll skip over it. And then Python, and then how you do some of these basic linear algebra operations that we've been discussing. And you'll see very, a lot of similarities and you'll see some syntactical differences. So let's say, for example, we have a three by four matrix. So that means it has three rows and four columns. In MATLAB, you would simply say the matrix A is equal to, and then in square brackets, you have the first row, semicolon, second row, semicolon, third row. And you can just separate the elements with spaces. You can use commas, but you can also just use spaces. When you hit return at the end of this, then on the screen, it will show you the matrix A in matrix form, just like this, the way you would like to see it. Mathematica, it uses squiggly brackets instead of square. It's just a different syntax. In Python, again, you'll need to import the NumPy library. Now you only have to do this once. I have in the tutorial, in every block of code, I've always imported all of the packages that are necessary for that block of code. But in fact, you only have to do it once per notebook. You don't have to keep doing it over and over again. I just wanted to, so if you copied and pasted one snippet of code that you would have everything you need and you wouldn't have to think, oh, well, what happened to NumPy or SciPy or whatever else? So uh, you would import NumPy as NP, for example, and then within NumPy, there's an array function and you'll see lots of brackets. So there's, there's parentheses and then square brackets. So the first row is in square brackets, the second row is in square brackets, the third row is in square brackets. All of the elements are separated by commas and then the rows also are separated by commas. So again, basically the same idea, just a little different syntax. Then to do matrix multiplication. So if I wanna multiply matrix A times B, in MATLAB it's A asterisk B, in Python, it's A at sign B. So remember, if I wanted to do in Python element by element multiplication, so multiply the first element times the first element, second by second, not matrix multiplication, then you would use the asterisk here instead. So this gets a little confusing. Why can't we all just agree and decide to use the same symbol? Uh -huh. Professor, no, we can't. yeah, go ahead. Real quick, someone yeah. in chat is asking if you could go back a slide. Uh, just sure. someone in chat is asking. Yep, thank yeah. you. Thanks for bringing that no to my worries. attention. Yeah, so is there a specific question on that, anybody? Or you just wanted to see it again? One thing uh, that to keep in mind here is in programming, we call them arrays. In math, we call them matrices. They are not exactly the same thing. However, they can be regarded. So the way to look at it is a matrix is an array, but an array is not a matrix. So an array is more general than a matrix. 
And an array can have any dimension you want. So it could be a one dimensional array, which we would call a vector. It could be a two dimensional array, we would call a matrix. It could be a three dimensional array for which there is no equivalent mathematical construct. It could be a 10th dimensional array. So it would have 10 indices with 10 dimensions of, of numbers. And it doesn't even have to be numbers. An array can have strings in it, so letters. It could have some elements are numbers, some elements are something else that are non-numerical. Whereas a matrix, of course, is all numbers. So we use arrays in programs to denote vectors and matrices. But I just want you to be aware of the fact that array is actually much more broad than that. So we're using arrays in a particular way to correspond to vectors and matrices. So all that to say, we'll kind of use that terminology somewhat synonymously. So when you hear me say, or you see in Python or MATLAB, you see the word array, that is a representation of a vector or a matrix typically. Okay, so again, uh, so that's A times B, here's the determinant. Here's the transpose, here's the inverse. And if we wanna solve A U equals B, we just have to enter in the coefficient matrix A and the right-hand side vector B. And then it's either lin solve, linear solve, or psi pi lin alg solve, okay? Uh, but basically the arguments are the same, same idea. So, you, you know, if you look at this on one hand, you say, oh my, I have to do so much more typing for Python. Uh, yeah, that's, that's one of the downsides to using Python is there tends to be more typing. However, Python code is very readable. Even if you don't know Python, you can look at a Python code and know what it's intending to do for the most part. MATLAB is pretty much the same way. You don't have a lot of weird esoteric things Although both of them will have places where you're like, why is there a semicolon or why is there a colon at the end of the line or why is there a colon in the middle of some array, things like that, which syntactically have significance, but uh, may seem somewhat arbitrary. Okay, thanks for helping each other out there. So that's, that's basically it. And then what you're gonna do is as you get you know, into one, and as we've talked about before, if you're a MATLAB geek and you wanna try Python, give it a try. If you don't like it and you wanna switch back partway through the semester, that's perfectly fine. You know, so, so, just, uh, so I'm gonna focus primarily on MATLAB and Python. So throughout when we're talking about certain methods and techniques and algorithms, I'll talk about how they can be done in MATLAB and how they can be done in Python. Usually in the notes, I'll also include Mathematica and there is a Mathematica tutorial, but since probably no one is using it, I, I will generally skip over those, but they're, they're in the slides, they're in the tutorial. So uh, again, just to draw your attention, I did update the Python tutorial as of Friday. So I sent out an email. So the version that's up on Blackboard as of Friday is a slightly expanded version from what was there before. So if you downloaded the previous version, you might want to download the new version. It, it, there's just more things in it. So pretty much everything we're going to do in this class, there are illustrations of how to do it in Python. So you can now do problem set number one. It is up on Blackboard. And just a few things to say about the problem sets, and this is true for all the problem sets, is be sure to look at the the whole problem set statement. So there's a cover page which has some instructions on it. So take a look at the cover page and the individual problems. For instructions, any special instructions. So usually the way it'll be is on the cover page, there'll be general instructions. So like for problem set one, it says, Unless stated otherwise, complete all problems using built-in functions in Python, MATLAB, or Mathematica. So you're immediately thinking, okay, so all the problems, unless it tells me anything else, unless it tells me something else, I'm going to use built-in functions, which means I'm not going to write a code to solve A U equals B. I'm going to use the lin solve function. 
I'm not going to write a code to do to the find the determinant, determine the determinant. I'm going to use the built-in determinant function in uh, MATLAB or Python. So then you know that that's the default. If I don't say anything in the problem statement, then you're going to use MATLAB or Python to complete the problem. But then also read the problem statements carefully. So I may say, like in problem one, I say, do these operations by hand. OK, so now I'm going to write those out. Or I'm going to, maybe it's in a Jupyter notebook, but I'm going to do them by hand, not using built-in functions in Python. So there are basically three possibilities. There's hand calculations. There are built-in functions. And there are user-defined functions, which I've talked about briefly before. So those are the things you should look for. Just and if it's you know if it's ever not clear, again, look at the cover page, read the problem statement, and it will tell you whether you should do it by hand, whether you should do it using built-in functions, or whether you should write a user-defined function. So the user-defined function is looking at Python or MATLAB more as a programming language. Well, there's not a built-in function to do this method, so I'm gonna have to write it myself. We won't be doing a lot of that, but I do wanna get, get you, give you some experience with that throughout the semester. So periodically I'll have you write a built-in, uh, sorry, a user-defined function yourself, just to get uh, used to it. And you may actually find that you really like it and that will uh, kind of guide your future endeavors to some extent. The second thing is, and this is true for all problem sets, is the way you'll turn them in is on Blackboard. And you'll do so with a single PDF. So whatever method you, so if you write stuff out by hand on paper, for hand calculations, that's fine. If you do some MATLAB calculations, obviously in MATLAB, if you have some figures, if you have some explanation, however you do it, that's all fine. But I want in the end, just one PDF that has everything in it. So, and then you'll turn that in directly on, on Blackboard. And this is, this is a great advertisement for Jupyter. Jupyter does a great job of this. So if you are using Python, this is a great reason to use Jupyter because all those things can be all incorporated into your Jupyter notebook. You can have your code, you can have explanations of the code, you can have just the results, plots, numbers, you can have discussion of the results all in one place and it's very handy. So however you do it, one single PDF is what you should turn in. The due date on prom set number one, I'm unless you guys would prefer something else. Generally in the past, I've found that students like a Friday at midnight deadline uh, because you're turning in electronically. There's no reason why it has to be on a Tuesday or Thursday at class time. And usually that's bad anyway, because then you're worried about that rather than engaged in the class. So the default will be Fridays at midnight will be the due dates. So for this one, I, I think that's the 12th. It's on Blackboard, but I think whatever next Friday is, not this Friday, but next Friday, I think it's the 12th. So that would be the general pattern. If, uh, if you guys prefer something different from that, we can discuss changing that. Again, there's no reason why it has to be coupled with a class time. So we'll take advantage of that. This is for you, not so much for us Americans, because we just, we just buy eggs. <laughs> We don't care where they come from, but if you go to other parts of the world, they care about the chickens. <laughs> so if you go to England, for example, or in parts of Europe, when you go to the grocery store, they will have a separate, oh, I forgot to change that. They will have a separate display for free range eggs, which means eggs from chickens who have been allowed to run free. So apparently, Presumably they're happier chickens. And I guess someone's figured out that happy chickens produce, well, they at least produce more expensive eggs. I don't know if they're any better. Uh, so this is, this is playing off of that. 
organic software by free range programmers and software by programmers in cubicles. So I suppose it could be the same idea. So this is, this is appropriate for COVID, you know, so programmers working at home, are they more productive than they were sitting at work in the office in a cubicle? So at some point in the future, they will tell us who the more productive programmers are. All right, any questions about any of that? Logistics for the problem set? Yes. Yeah, so, okay, so a built-in, let me actually, this is maybe an easier way to think about it. I should have put this on here. So when I talk about built-in functions, what I mean is this. So you are using MATLAB or Python as you would MATLAB typically. So like I said, rather than if I want to, if I ask for the inverse, if you're using a built-in function, then that means using this. That means using this. So for the inverse, it would be that. So that's a built-in function. It's built into the software and it does all the work for you. A user-defined function would be using Python or MATLAB, whoops, that's my other class, would be using it as a programming language. So in that case, a user-defined function would be more down here. So then if I say, you write a code using a user-defined function to do the bisection method to find the root of some function. That means you're gonna write the actual code in the form of a function to accomplish that. Rather than calling a function in MATLAB or Python to do it, you're gonna write the function yourself. So that's a user-defined function. Does that make more sense? Okay. If you ever have any questions about that, just email me or you can clarify on Slack as well so that there's no confusion. But that's the terminology that we'll use throughout the semester and we'll be consistent with that. Anything else? Would you prefer pencil and paper for end calculations? That's totally up to you. So if you, I mean, the slickest way to do it it's maybe a little more time consuming, but, and if you're aware of what LaTeX is, uh, then you will probably know how wonderful it is. If you're not, then, uh, you know, sometime we'll, we'll talk about that, maybe not in class, but, uh, so you can use, you could use Word with the equation editor, which is lousy. You could use LaTeX to type up your, your quote unquote hand calculations, or you can simply write them out by hand and then just scan scan your handwritten uh, pages. So whatever is your preference is fine with me. Uh, you know, obviously there's time investment, but it may be well spent if you wanna learn something like LaTeX. And again, you don't have to do it all one or the other. So if you have a little extra time, try it out. Try, if you're using Jupyter, try learning a little bit of LaTeX and typing up the equations in LaTeX within Jupyter and see if maybe you'll fall in love with it and it'll be, you'll live happily ever after. And then you switch back because you don't have the time next time. That's perfectly fine. So whatever your preference is, is fine. Anything else on, on those issues? So that's it for my MATLAB Python in-depth discussions. Basically for the rest of the semester, we'll talk, be talking about methods methods and more methods. And then for each method, I will point you to the MATLAB and Python functions that do it, if they exist. Some methods, there is no built-in function to point you to, uh, but when there is, I'll, I will point you to it. And if it's a Python function, then they're also probably included in the Python tutorial. MATLAB, as I've said before, my M files, my introductory M files for MATLAB are more, uh, elementary and Spartan and have not been updated with all these these cool built-in tools but you can easily find them on uh, on the web and I'm, I'm giving you generally speaking in the notes and 
the, the slides, I will be giving you the commands and the various options that you would want to choose and so on. Okay, so again, continuing on the theme of linear algebraic equations, which is our primary focus right now, or has been, I want to change gears a little bit and now talk about how we would solve them using numerical methods. So, so far, we've looked at them the way we normally do as undergrads in a math class. There's systems of linear algebraic equations. We have coefficient matrix A. We have right-hand side vector B. We want to solve using, say, Gauss elimination or finding the inverse or Kramer's rule. So that's all fine for small little toy problems for classes. But we need to talk about how to solve big ones. And to do big ones, we're going to have to develop other methods for doing so for the reasons I'll mention. So let me just introduce that and, and explain why. So again, our focus is on solving A u equals B. So I've done examples that lead to an A u equals B to motivate why we care about solving these as engineers. We've talked about how to solve them using Gauss elimination, inverse, and Kramer's rule to get the exact solutions. So that's all fine. However, in many situations, these methods are really only appropriate for small systems of equations. If you're doing it by hand, small means like two to five unknowns. So two by two, three by three, four by four, five by five. As you get bigger, Gauss elimination, just think about it. What's involved? Finding an inverse, just think about it. What's involved? More and more work. I wouldn't really want to have to do a six by six by hand. I mean, I could do it, but I wouldn't want to have to do it. And I'd probably make several mistakes along the way. So then, of course, you go to mathematical software. So that's using Python MATLAB built-in functions, right? So using built-in functions with these techniques, you could probably do tens of unknowns. So that might be like 50 by 50, maybe 70, 80 by 80, maybe 100 by 100. That's getting a little big, but certainly not thousands by thousands or millions by millions. And that's what we're really moving towards when we're talking about large scale engineering problems, large scale uh, systems of equations that result from solving differential equations, for example. They're not going to be 100 by 100. And so we will need other techniques in order to solve them using uh, numerical methods rather than these exact techniques. So we need to have this background understanding so we can see how these methods compare and why they might be faster and what ways they are faster. Uh, but we're generally going to have to be moving towards uh, much bigger problems, which we solve using numerical methods. And that will lead us into needing to approximate things. So this is called computational linear algebra or numerical linear algebra. Obviously, linear, linear algebra is a field of mathematics that we've been talking about using vectors and matrices. And computational or numerical linear algebra is how do you solve these big systems? How do you get an inverse of a massive matrix? How do you get eigenvalues and eigenvectors of a huge matrix? Those sorts of things. Generally speaking, we're going to be talking in terms of direct methods and iterative methods. There are two classes of methods that we'll be using to solve these equations. All of the techniques we've talked about so far, Gauss elimination, inverse, and Kramer's rule, those are all direct methods. So a direct method is there is a set of steps. You follow the set of steps. You know exactly how many steps you have to follow. And when you're done, you have the exact solution. If you've used all exact arithmetic, you have the exact solution. That's a direct method. You directly get the solution. An iterative method is where you have a process that you carry out. And at the end of each time you carry out that process, that's one iteration, you get an approximation for the solution. Now it's wrong, but it's at least moving in the direction of the solution. Then you do that same set of steps again, one more iteration, and you get a better approximation. Again, a better approximation. And you keep doing that hundreds or even thousands of times. A computer do it, does it. And then in the end, you have an approximation, hopefully a good one, of the actual system of equations. So the outcome is an approximate solution rather than the exact solution. But you hope, and for it to be worthwhile, it has to be much faster 
and much more efficient for very, very large systems of equations. So that's really where we're going with this. Now, this, of course, is perfect on a computer. An iterative method is perfect on a computer because it's a, it's a set of steps you program it to do. And you just say, you literally tell the computer, keep doing this until you have converged towards the solution. And then you stop and you have an approximation. So the computer is doing all the work, obviously. Now, one of the things you'll notice is when we're dealing with small systems, the methods that we use, we prefer them to be easy to remember because I don't want to have to look in a book every time I do Gaussian elimination. I want a method that's easy to remember and relatively straightforward to carry out, carry out by hand. It may not be the most efficient method. That's fine. I'm, a, I'm willing to give up a little bit of efficiency for ease of carrying it out. Whereas if I'm going to have a computer do it, I only have to program it once. And so I can have a much more complex algorithm, but I want it to be efficient because I, and I'm going to run it over and over again on different systems and I want to get the solution back as quickly as I can. Now, again, these are thousands by thousands, millions by millions of system of, uh, unknowns equations. So I want to get the solution back very quickly. If the process has to be more complicated, that's perfectly fine because I only have to program it once. And again, the likelihood or there's a possibility that someone else has already programmed it for us. So that's really kind of where things are going with the iterative versus the direct methods. So generally speaking, iterative methods are gonna win out as the system gets bigger. Iterative methods, it's their advantages tend to grow uh, over direct methods. So any system could be solved using direct methods or iterative methods. I could solve a three by three system using iterative methods and we will do that but it may not be the best method. Uh, same thing with million by million. I could solve it using Gauss elimination, not by hand, but on a computer, but it won't be the fastest, most efficient way to do it. So as we move towards bigger and bigger problems, we're gonna shift our emphasis from direct to iterative methods. That's just kind of the natural progression of how these things go. All right, before I actually get into the algorithms themselves, we need to talk a little bit about how computers generate, store, and use numbers. So we're going to talk a little bit about round off error and what the source of that is and what it can do to our calculations, and also operation counts, which I'll explain in a second. So because everything is now approximate, we're not using exact arithmetic, and everything is approximate, we need to have a, a good feeling and good intuition for what is actually happening in the computer when it does the calculation and what effects that may have on the solutions and results that we get. We'll then come back and we'll talk about direct methods and iterative methods. The direct methods are gonna be ones that we haven't looked at so far. They're gonna be ones that are appropriate, more appropriate for larger systems. And then we'll talk about iterative methods which are appropriate for basically systems of any size as long as it can fit on your computer. But before we do that, let's talk about approximation and its effects, operation counts and round off errors. So operation counts is relatively straightforward conceptually. The idea is if I have a direct method, I know exactly what steps I need to carry out, and I know how many times I need to carry, carry them out. If I have a three by three matrix, I'm gonna do Gauss elimination, I can just start adding up multiplication, subtractions, divisions, and what did I miss? Additions. And I can just start adding them up. How many times do I have to do an addition, subtraction, multiplication, division? Okay, I'm gonna divide through by this number all the way across to make that a one. Then I'm gonna eliminate the elements below it. There's two of them, zero, zero. How many additions, subtractions, multiplications, divisions do I need to zero this, zero this? I can just start adding up operation counts. And of course you think, well, why would I wanna do that? The reason why I wanna to, want to do that is because if I have two different algorithms that do the same thing, my first, pass at determining which one is better than the other is which one requires fewer operations. If one requires few operations, then it'll get done faster on my computer. So generally speaking, that's the idea. Also, I can estimate how long it's gonna take on my computer based on how many operations are gonna be required. So let's just take a simple example. We have an inner product or a dot product of two n-dimensional vectors. 
So just ask yourself, if I have two vectors, each of which is n-dimensional, so it has n elements, how many addition, subtractions, multiplications, and divisions are required to calculate that inner product? Well, here's the result. It's u1 times v1 plus u2 times v2, u3 times v3, all the way up to un times vn. So there are n, capital N multiplications, right? And there are capital N minus one additions, because there's one fewer to add up all those terms. So there are n multiplications and n minus one additions. So n plus n minus one, well, that's two n minus one. So that's the operation count for doing the inner product or dot product of two n dimensional vectors. Obviously, as the vectors get bigger, as n get bi gets bigger, I have more operations that I need to perform. This is the exact number of operations. More typically, what we care about is how the number of operations scales with the size of the problem. So the fact that I have to do one less addition than I do multiplication, that's not so important. If n is a thousand or n is a million, this, this, whether this is a plus or minus one doesn't really matter. What really kills me is this 2n. So if it's a thousand dimensional vectors, then two times a thousand, that's how many operations I need to do. Well, really it's one less than that, but that, that doesn't matter. I wanna know how does it scale as n changes, as n gets bigger. So we say that it is 2n, or we might even say it's order n. If something is order n, that means it increases linearly with n. So whether the multiplier out front is two or three or 5.7 doesn't so much matter. What I'm telling you is what we're learning is that it scales linearly with n. If I double the number of points n, then it doubles the amount of operations I have to do. Whether it's two times that or four times that or 7.35, eight times that doesn't so much matter. So you'll see it, you'll see the operation count either as an exact number like this, like this, or like this. Does that make sense? It's a little confusing. Typically, we will use this one or this one, because again, what we care about is how do these operations, number of operations uh, scale with the size of the problem? I don't care for a, a five dimensional vector. What do I care? I care about a 500 dimensional vector. That's where it really matters. If I were, for example, to do matrix multiplication of two n by n matrices, so how, what would be the operation count? Well, if I have two n by n matrices and I have to do matrix multiplication of them, think about what matrix multiplication requires. It requires for each element in the, in the product matrix, the result requires an inner product of a row and a column. A, the ith row of the first matrix and the jth column of the second matrix. So that's an inner product. Well, I already just determined that the operation count for the inner product is two n minus one. Well, how many inner products do I have to do? I have to do n squared of them, n times n for all the elements in all my rows and all my columns. So the total operation count is n squared times two n minus one. So that's the exact operation count in terms of the, the scale as n increases, we would say it's either two times n cubed, two times n cubed, or it's order n cubed, okay? This is the least specific, the next better, and this is the most specific in terms of the actual operation count. These just tell you how it scales with n, this gives you the actual number, the exact number. So you'll notice, so the n squared term here, well, as n gets big, n cubed gets bigger much faster. So that's why as n gets big, we don't care about this term in comparison to this term. So that's why it's order n cubed or two n cubed. Gauss elimination. So I'm not gonna walk you through where this number comes from, but Gauss elimination on an n by n matrix, and we'll use this for comparison of other matrices, other 
other methods for solving them requires two thirds times n cubed operations. That's equivalent to this one. It's not the exact number, but that's how it scales with n cubed. So it's order n cubed. So if I double n, the number of operations goes up by two cubed, which is a factor of eight. So if I double the size of the matrix, the number of operations required to do Gaussian elimination goes up by a factor of eight. Obviously that's a lot worse than if it just went up by a factor of, of two, uh, you know, multiply by N. So actually we'll, again, we'll compare uh, other methods with this. If we can bring down the power of on the N, that's great. If we can reduce this so that it's order N squared instead of order N cubed, as N gets big, the gap between N squared and N cubed gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And the gain is huge. If that's not possible, then maybe we can at least reduce this coefficient out front and make it smaller. So maybe instead of two thirds n cubed, maybe it's one third n cubed or maybe a half n cubed. So it's not way better than Gauss elimination, but it's better than Gauss elimination. So that's what we're gonna be looking for is can we bring down this power and or can we bring down this coefficient? If I can drop this to a third, well, that's twice as fast because it's a half, right? A third versus two thirds. So that's pretty good. Now, if I could drop this down from a three to a two, that's an even bigger gain, as I, as I said. The notation we use that order n squared is much less than order n cubed. So a double less than sign or a double greater than sign, that's much less than or much greater than. So that means they're way bigger. So, you know, obviously less than or bigger, you know, so zero is less than one, but it's not much less than one. Zero is much less than a thousand, but not much less than one. So that's the notation that we'll, we'll typically be using. Now, as I said, you could then use these operation counts along with the, the data from your central processing unit, the CPU, to estimate how long it's gonna to take to do some of these operations on your CPU. Oftentimes we don't do this, but you can if you want to. So if you know how many operations, you know how many operations per second your CPU can do, then you can estimate how long it's gonna take. We've talked about some of these uh, terms before. FLOPS stands for floating point operations per second. We've discussed that before. A floating point, it's kind of like scientific notation. So it means that you have a set number of significant figures, but the decimal point floats, quote unquote. So again, think of it like scientific notation. So it's one digit uh, decimal point, And then in our case, usually 15 significant figures beyond the decimal point. And then it might be times 10 to the 14, times 10 to the minus 14. But so the decimal point floats in that sense. Okay, let's talk about round off errors. So round off errors are a concern because of how large the number of operations are required to do some of these calculations can get. So if it requires, if, if I have an order, if my operation count is say 50, then I probably don't care about round off errors because they're not, I'm not doing that many calculations, whatever round off errors exist, they're gonna remain small. But if I'm doing 50,000 or 50 million operations, then maybe now I'm gonna to have to care and worry about what happens to round off errors. So let me talk about first where they come from, just very simply. And we've discussed this briefly before, but let's make it more concrete. So because we have floating point approximations of our numbers, no number in the computer is actually what it should be. So just as a simple example, if you want the number in the computer to be two thirds, well, instead it's gonna be 0.6666666667. Now this is supposed to be, I think it is 16 significant figures. The point is, it's not exactly two thirds. So there's a round off error. There's a tiny little error in that 16th decimal place and beyond because of the fact that we had to round off the number. Now that's true for two thirds. It's actually true for any number. If you put one into a computer, it's not 1.0000000000. 000 000 000 000 000. 
that last digit might be five, it might be two, it might be one. So it's not exactly one. The reason for that is because of this. When we think of the number line mathematically, if you take any two numbers, so between zero and one say, how many numbers are there between zero and one? Well, there's an infinity of them, right? And I can take a smaller between zero and a quarter, zero and whatever. How many numbers are there between those? There's an infinity of them. But from a computer's point of view, the smallest interval that a computer can recognize is two to the minus 51. Now, why two? I won't get into the details of this because it gets very boring and esoteric and tedious. But basically, uh, computers all use base two arithmetic. So everything is just two to some power. And the smallest you can get on a computer is two to the minus 51 without doing some strange uh, gymnastics in the computer. Well, what does that correspond to? That corresponds to about four times 10 to the minus 16. So rather than the number line between zero and one being divided up into an infinity of numbers, rational and irrational numbers, it's actually divided up into intervals of 4.4 times 10 to the minus 16. And you say, well, they're small. Well, yeah, they're small. And in most cases, they're small enough, but they're not zero. So now there's a discrete number of numbers between any number, two sets of numbers on the number line. So for example, if I do a calculation and I add some stuff, multiply some stuff, subtract some stuff, and I get as my final result, 4.37986437 times 10 to the minus 16. That really is, is zero. It's probably supposed to be zero. If I were to do it using exact arithmetic, it's probably supposed to be zero. But the computer doesn't know that. And the computer can't give me zero unless I trick it into doing exact arithmetic. And so it gives me some number times 10 to the minus 16. So that's essentially zero. Anything smaller than this, you can regard as probably being zero. Although again, I don't actually know for sure. So that's the source of round off errors. Every calculation you do basically introduces an error of about that size. Not exactly that number, but roughly that size, 10 to the minus 16. So it's messing in that last decimal place. That last decimal place, just like here, I can't rely on it. That's not correct. So that's producing this round off error, these round off errors. Okay, that's the first issue. And that's the one we're focused on right now uh, that when we have these round off errors. The second issue, which we're not gonna talk about until much later in the semester is numerical stability. The idea is if I'm gonna do operation count of a million, Every time I do those million calculations, I have a little round off error of roughly this size. So they're adding up, they're adding up, they're adding up, they're adding up. The question is, what does my algorithm do with those tiny little errors? Do they add up to be something times 10 to the minus 16? In which case I'm perfectly happy because they're basically in that last decimal place. Or do those errors grow because of the way the algorithm is working, do they grow such that they become of order 10 to the minus five, 10 to the minus two, maybe they become order one. Well, now I have to worry about those errors because they've completely polluted my solution. So we'll talk about this again later in the, sem in the semester, but just to put it here in our minds. So there's the round off error itself and there's the effect that our round off error has on the algorithm and the solutions that it's producing that we'll talk about as well. Okay, let me describe these round off errors uh, more exactly, more specifically in how we can try to quantify them and understand the effect that they have. So let's say I'm solving a system of equations, right? Some small to moderate sized system of equations. I'm doing it by hand. So my only diagnostic to determine whether that's gonna work or not is to check the determinant, right? So if the determinant is equal to zero, determinant of A is equal to zero, then I know there is no unique solution to my system of equations. If it's not equal to zero, then I expect that there is. Great. 
that's fine for small to moderate sized systems of equations. I just need to check the determinant. If it's zero, bad, non-zero, good. What happens though, if I have a large system of equations, I calculate the determinant and rather than getting zero or non-zero, say I get 0.000001. And I say, okay, well, that's not exactly equal to one. So I guess I can get a solution, but it's pretty darn small. So it's prop, maybe it's supposed to actually be zero. And it's just that I have round off errors and the, and the computer's not giving me the exact answer. So then the question becomes, okay, well, it's not singular, but it's sure close to being singular. And the question then is how close to zero is bad? And again, for small matrices, this is not an issue. For very large matrices, this is very likely to happen sometimes. So how close to zero is too small? How close to zero do I say, oh, the matrix is singular and it doesn't have a unique solution? So we need a way to determine how wrong our solution is. I have an approximation for the solution U and I need to determine how wrong that is. The easiest way or the, the most natural way to do that is to define the error vector E. The error vector E is simply the difference between the exact solution, I'll call it U hat, and my approximate numerical solution U. The difference between them is the error. Great, well, that's simple, except there's one minor problem. I don't know the exact solution. If I knew the exact solution, there would be no need for me to get an approximate numerical solution. So I don't know the U hat, therefore I can't get the error. So conceptually, the error does exist and I can do operations on the error. I can think about mathematically what the error might do and how it might behave, but I can't actually calculate the error because I'd have to know the exact solution in order to do so. So we need an alternative. The alternative is called the residual. So when you think of residual, I always think of like when I'm baking in my kitchen and I'm done, there's residual flour and there's residual ingredients all over the counter and all over the floor. That's residuals. What's left over when you've done some operation. So it's actually the same idea here. So I'm trying to solve A U equals B. If my U is not exactly the right answer, if it's some approximation, but it's not correct, I could take B minus A U. I could calculate that and that'll give me some non-zero number. Now, if if it's the exact solution U, then when I take B minus A U, it'll give me a residual of zero. But if I have an approximation for U and not the exact U, then this will give me a non-zero residual. And obviously the bigger the residual is, the, the worse. The smaller it is, the better. So it's like a proxy for, it's an alternative to the error. Now, there's two problems with the residual. One is easy to fix, the second one. The first one is a little bit more subtle and is going to encourage us to find an alter another alternative to the residual. The first problem is that for some A, not all A, but for some A, the residual might be small, in which case I'm happy, but it turns out that the error is actually quite large but there's no way for me to know that because I can't check the error. So if I'm using the residual as a proxy or replacement for the error, I would like it to be the case that when the residual is small, the error is small, when the residual is large, the error is large. But there are cases, normally that is true, but there are cases where even though the residual is small, so I think everything's okay, it turns out the error, the actual error, which I don't know, is quite large. So that's one problem. The second thing is the residual is actually a vector. I would like to have one number, a single number, a scalar number that quantifies how bad my solution is. So rather than a vector of numbers, I would like a single number. Let's actually address the second point first because that's easy to fix. And then we'll address this first efficiency second. So the easy fix for the second deficiency is to use what's called the norm. That's a mathematical term for basically the length of a vector. So when you have a vector, a force vector, and you wanna find the result, resultant, 
you know, you take the square root of the sum of the squares of the components, right? And that gives you a number. That's the length of the vector. That's the resultant force. That is the resultant velocity. Mathematically, we call that the norm. We denote it by these two vertical bars. Single vertical bars is the determinant. Two vertical bars is the norm. Base, the, the subscript two means it's a base two or an L2 norm, don't worry about that. What that means is it's, again, it's, it's exactly equal to the length of the vector. So it's the square root of the sum of the squares of the components of the vector, no matter what the length is. So now that just gives us a number, it's a scalar number. Because you square them, take the square root, you just get a number in the end that gives us a residual, a number that represents how wrong my entire solution is rather than a vector. There is also a norm for matrices as well. There's an L2 norm and here's the definition. All you have to do, remember is it has something to do with eigenvalues of the matrix. We'll get back to eigenvalues later in this chapter and we'll talk more about that when the time comes. But for now, we just need a way to get a number out of our vector. So that, that's, that's easy. The harder issue, that first efficiency, the fix is to use what's called the condition number. So we went from the air, sounds good, easy to define, impossible to evaluate, fine. So then we go to the residual. I can always calculate the residual, but it's not always going to be a good indicator of the magnitude of the error for the reasons I discussed. So then the next diagnostic is what's called the condition number. The condition number is definitive. It will never lie to you. The residual might lie to you. The condition number will never lie to you. You can always trust it. Math sign math pi. Yeah, so this is a good example that Marek came up with. So if you do math dot sign of math dot pi in Python, if you did that on paper, you would get zero because that is the sign of pi and the sign of pi mathematically exactly is zero. But instead what Python will give you, he indicated is 1.22 times 10 to the minus 16. So that's round off error. So it, it did not do it exactly. It approximated that uh, calculation. And so it gave you a number that is basically zero to what we call machine precision. So when we talk about machine precision, that's the precision of the machine, obviously. And in our case for double precision arithmetic, that's 10 to the minus 16 kinds of numbers. So yeah, that's a perfect example. And you can, you can play with that all day and all night and do different calculations where you know what the answer should be and see that you're always gonna get a number that's off by about 10 to the minus 16 from what it's supposed to be. Yeah, thanks, that's a perfect example. Okay, so the condition number will denote it either by C-O-N-D or some people use kappa, the Greek letter kappa. Again, the subscript two means that we're gonna use the L2 norm in its definition. And it's, this is the definition of the condition number. It's equal to the product of the norms of A and the inverse of A. You don't have to worry about that. That's not terribly important. In fact, after our discussion of the condition number here in this section, we'll probably never mention the condition number again. I want you to know what it is and what, how it's used, but it's hard to calculate. It's a lot of work to calculate for the reasons I'll mention in a moment. And so I want you to be aware of it, but we're not actually gonna use it much throughout the semester. It results in a number between one and infinity. One is good, because one means that these two have the same norm. The norm of A and the norm of the inverse of A are the same. That's good. That's the best case scenario possible. They could be very different, such that uh, the condition number gets very, very large and goes to infinity. That's the worst case scenario. So the smaller, the closer to one, the better. We say that that is well conditioned or the larger, the closer to infinity, we say that that is ill conditioned. So rather than being a binary yes, no, like the determinant, is the determinant zero or is it not? Yes or no? 
now we have a range between one and infinity. And we can tell based on that number, what's gonna happen to our calculations, which I'll illustrate in just a moment. The good thing about the condition number and the reason why it fixes that first efficiency of the residual is that a small condition number, in other words, one close to one, always corresponds, you can prove this mathematically, to a small error. For example, an inverting A. It could be any operation on A, but we'll think in terms of inverting A. If I'm gonna invert A, and my condition number is close to one, then I can be guaranteed mathematically that my error will be small. So that's good. And that again was not the case for the residual in all cases, in all situations. All right, so the larger the condition number, the worse things get. Now, how big or how small is too big or too small? Well, there's an easy way to check this. You can estimate the number of digits of accuracy that you're going to lose by taking the log base 10 of the condition number. So you take the, this is not an exact uh, result, but it is actually quite accurate. It's an approximation, but it's a very accurate approximation. You take log base 10 of the condition number, and that will tell you how many digits of accuracy you expect to lose. And I'll show you by example what happens. So we're using double precision. That corresponds to 16 significant figures. So if this tells me I'm going to lose five or six or whatever, then I know how many I have left. If I start with 16 and I lose five, well, I have 11 accurate digits left. OK, I know. If I start with 16 and I lose 16, then I know my, my solution is horrible. OK, so I, I, I know exactly, not exactly, but I know very precisely what I expect to happen. Now, in my example of losing five or six, five to six digits, is that good? Is that bad? Well, it depends what I'm gonna do with that number. If that's a final number, and if I just want three or four significant figures of accuracy, that's perfectly fine. If I'm gonna use that number as input into something else, then maybe that's not good. All right, we'll stop there. And uh, I will give you on Thursday, an alternative to the condition number that is much, much easier to test for. And then we'll do some examples of some fun matrices that are horribly ill-conditioned and we'll look at uh, how ill-conditioned they are and what the effect that has on operations like inverses and so forth. So we'll do that on Thursday. All right, so I'll see you then. We'll pick this up then. Any questions, comments, concerns, issues, complaints? Yes. Yeah. So when you, okay, there's two issues. So with the, so the question is about SciPy and NumPy and what do I have to do to have access to them basically? If you use Anaconda to install Python on your computer, then everything you need is installed. You never have to actually install from beyond your computer, NumPy or SciPy. So that's the first thing. So you have NumPy and SciPy on your computer. Then all you're doing when you say import NumPy or import SciPy, all you're doing is say not go out in the internet and to GitHub someplace and find it and install it on my computer. You're just saying this is on my computer. I want to have access to it in this Python code, in this Jupyter notebook. So within the, the notebook, all you, you just do it once. You're always going to use NumPy and SciPy. So import NumPy as NP, import SciPy as SP at the top and then you can access all of them. And, and again, it's, does that make sense? You're not actually installing anything. All you're doing is saying, it's already installed on my computer. Please make it available for me to use. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Yep. And then everything, and all that stuff, you never have to. The Anaconda installs everything. You'll never have to install anything else. So if you're reading a book or looking at a website and they say install this, Anaconda has already done that for you. And that's the beauty of Anaconda. Good, glad you brought that up, yep.
<laughs> yes, Vince, we're out of time. So I'm going to have to charge you extra. <laughs> so there isn't a question from Anthony about the difference between Jupiter and Spider. Uh, look at the Python notebook, uh, sorry, the Python tutorial to get some indication of that. And, uh, and that should answer that question. Yeah, sorry, we're out of time. I know we'll uh, pick it up on Thursday.